Good evening, everyone. My name is Maggie, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with Rebecca Wal uh, Walker and Lily Diamond in conversation with Tracy McMillan, discussing What's Your Story? A Journal for Everyday Evolution. These books tonight will come signed with book plates. Um, we're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website at booksoup.com, as well as our social media at booksoup. Our next event is tomorrow, December 9th at 6, 6 p.m. with Christopher Zida in conversation with Barbara Abercrombie discussing the storm, one voice from the AIDS generation. For regular updates on our upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter, which you can do on our website. To submit a question during the event, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to, if you'd like to see, if you see a question on the list that you'd like our speakers to answer, please click the like button. We will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Please do not use the sidebar chat to ask a question. Mm. Also support our bookstore and our authors and purchase a copy of tonight's featured book. To do that, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process. We're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those who are interested. A little more about Rebecca Walker. Rebecca is a best selling author, editor, and cultural critic who has contributed to the global conversation about race, gender, culture, and power for over two decades. She has spoken at over 400 universities, conferences, literary festivals, and corporate campuses around the world, and is the co-founder of the Third Wave Fund, an organization that supports women and transgender youth working for social justice. Rebecca has won many awards and was named by Time Magazine as one of the most influential leaders of her generation. A little more about Lily Diamond. Lily is a writer, educator, and advocate working to democratize wellness through storytelling accessible practices for inner and outer nourishment, and revolutionary acts of self-care in relationship to our earth and our human communities. Lily is the author of the best-selling memoir cookbook, Kale and Caramel, Recipes for Body, Heart, and Table, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, Vice, Healthy-ish, Women's Review, Refinery29, and more. A little more about Tracy McMillan. Uh, she's a television writer, memoirist, relationship expert, and host of the reality show, Family or Fiance on OWN TV. Her viral TED, TEDx talk, The Person You Really Need to Marry, has more than 15 million views. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Rebecca, Lily, and Tracy. Enjoy the presentation, thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks, Maggie. Hello, you guys. I'm so excited to be here. I love you both and I love your book. And I'm so glad, I'm looking at it right here. I'm so glad that you wrote it. And congratulations on your publication day. Thank you. Because like, I just wanna start by saying, so often people will say to me, I wanna change, but how? How do I do it? And I feel like this book is the how. That's because it's about aligning with yourself. And as you get into alignment with yourself, growth, change, healing naturally occurs. So can you talk about a little bit about your relationship and how you guys came together to write this book just as a starter? Sure, Lily, you start. Sure, happy to. So happy also to be here with you too and everyone um, who is watching really so appreciate your being with us in this moment. Um, what's your story began 11 years ago. I was a student in Rebecca's Art of Memoir masterclass and I was at a time of really deep pivotal change in my life. Um, I had just gone through a deep heartbreak and um, the loss of my mother relatively suddenly, and everything in my life was in this state of being completely rearranged. Um, I was also stepping away from a professional role and identity that I had held for about seven years. 
And I knew that I wanted to get back to the one thing that had always been at my core, which was writing and storytelling. And so I came mm -hmm. into this course and um, not really understanding the work that I had to do, but was invited into this space um, that Rebecca held. Uh, and that invitation was really one to be honest in a way that I mm -hmm. never had before with myself even though I thought I had, wasn't like I was running around, you know, consciously being dishonest in any way. Um, I held myself and still do hold myself to, you know, very high levels of transparency and accountability, but there was a way in which to be honest with myself in the, um, with the rigorousness that I needed to, to get real about what my story was at that time and not to be living out the other stories that I had been telling that had been given to me by my family, my culture, the profession that I was in, um, it's a lot harder than I understood. And so as I came out of that work um, and you know moved deeper into writing my story, Rebecca and I began to look at how we could create a set of questions and a method around this practice of asking um, the questions that get to the core truth, that really let people get to their honest answers without such struggle. Because it is really hard to, to be honest with ourselves often. And, um, and so we began that work, you know, 11 years ago. And uh, here we are today, and I'll let Rebecca continue the story. Yeah, um, I'm so, so happy to be here tonight with all of you, with these dear women um, that I have spent time with over the last decade in different ways and, and whom I really, really respect and admire. Um, and I can't wait to possibly see some of you post COVID and, and share, you know, some little bit that possibly was inspired by this gathering tonight. Um, thank you for coming to spend some time with us. I know there are many other things to do, even though it's COVID, um, but it's really precious to me that you wanted to come and be with us. So thank you. Um, we started doing this book, as Lily said, many, many years ago. Um, it came out of some work that we did together. Um, I think fundamentally, um, my whole career, my whole, you know, the last 25 years, I have spent uh, rewriting my own story from my first memoir, which was Black, White, and Jewish, which was about really looking at the way in which my identity had been very fragmented as a multiracial person, how I felt very broken, um, and the process of actually writing a story, writing that memoir, was a process of committing that old story to paper and letting it go and creating a space for the sort of tragic mulatto narrative to die and a space for what I like to call the magic mulatto <laughs> to, to arrive, you know, or at least um, the whole integrated self that I imagined myself to be, that I could become. And so that writing process, um, it has been very important to me. My second book, very, very similar, Baby Love, about growing up with a story um, that being a mother was a, was a kind of enslavement. I grew up in a very um, a community that really believed that motherhood could be a kind of entrapment. And I really longed to have a child. And so writing that memoir was about letting go of that story and making a space for becoming a mother and learning about how powerful that experience could be. And then, you know, many, many books later and many, many, you know, um, essays that I have edited about people, you know, really challenging the stories they grew up with, including stories of toxic masculinity, um, in what makes a man and, and, and stories of new family configurations. And just, you know, this work of making a space for new stories has been, is in my DNA. It is what I believe I am here to do. And so in many ways, this book um, is a, a kind of summation of that work. It is a kind of symbolic embodiment of, 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 of a calling. And it's really um, a way for me to be of service. It's the way that I want to open a space for whoever is ready to 
put down their old story of who they think they are, whether it's broken, whether it's to this, to that, um, and, and imagine a new one and take the steps that are necessary to get there. And I believe in the power of writing to do that alchemical, magical, transformational work. And so this book is really, um, it, it really came out of that impulse. And I think we both feel that this time, especially this moment in history, when we are all really trying to figure out who we are as Americans, as human beings, as citizens, that, <clears throat> that this is a, a, a moment um, in which this book can really be of service, you know, in, in, in a very critical way, because we must redefine our story, how we are going to relate to the earth, to each other, to politics, to, to our bodies. This is a, a, a real reckoning. So here we are, that, that is the long, the long story. Um, oh my gosh, oh there's so much there. I mean, just to touch on what you just said, I feel like the first thing that COVID did was reveal a whole lot of story that had been peripheral or covered under all sorts of activity where we're all driving around all day long and like running around and doing things. And there was a, something about being, a, you know, it's like someone blew a whistle and we all had to stop moving. And all of a sudden you could see what was really there. And the beginning, to me, the very first step of this whole story business is realizing that most of what, you know, we might be the, uh, the goldfish inside the inside the bowl going what water the first thing about a story is to realize that most of what you think is one you know like you totally. it's not it's not like the truth it's a story exactly. and so who wrote that story and and then we have to empower ourselves to rewrite it and that's what you're doing with this book and I think along those same lines, not only did we have that moment of freezing, looking around, taking stock of what the narratives are that we've been living under and why, but also we suddenly had this sense of the tenuousness of all of these rules and stories that we've been living and abiding by. And so many of us through both COVID, through the social justice uprisings that took us into the summer and beyond, we saw suddenly this question of wait, why, who made up these rules? Who are they benefiting? Why are we abiding by them if they don't benefit us and the people that we care about and everyone in our community? Um, and so the book really takes us from that deep internal perspective of looking at from the mind, the body, you know, relationships, the stories that we uh, hold and occupy within our own beings into how those then ripple out into the spaces of work, how we interface with technology, um, how we relate to the natural world and the environment all the way through to our communities and to our mortality. Yeah. I'm really interested in this idea of COVID though, because I, I mean, obviously we've been thinking about this book in the context of COVID, but you are mm -hmm. so right in that, you know, it, it, through this lock, this lockdown, mm -hmm. um, there, there is a kind of complete, not complete, but, but there was a, there, there has been a kind of erasure of the old story of where we were going, of how we needed to get there, what, you know, the sort of drive, the, the the pattern, the repetition of our daily lives that yeah. really shaped our identities at such a profound level. And we weren't even really aware of mm -hmm. it, anything more than just decisions we were making about where we were going and the actual, you know, the, the sort of track that we were on. But now that all of that is gone, <laughs> there really is this moment of, of well, where are we? Who are we? What what is this moment? And what is our story in this? And and I think that what I have found in this, and, and and my family has found, is that it's a roller coaster of stories. I mean, the COVID story. There's phase one COVID story where we thought we were going to get out of it. We started walking <laughs> miles a day. You know, the second phase of the COVID story. The story was, oh my God. Cares. This is never going to change. Everything sucks. I can't get out of bed. You know, this is the end of the world. Phase three, you know, this, so, so there has been a very interesting consciousness for me around 
the different stories that I have told myself and lived even in the context of COVID. Um, and I think that's pretty extraordinary because it's such a, an extraordinary situation to be so aware mm -hmm. of right. that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and to have it be revealed so clearly that I've been in some sort of a Maya illusion yeah. that where I thought I could predict something. But right. I, just, I know for me personally, I just wanted to embrace because I come from storytelling. I remember, you know, did you ever read Sacred Contracts? And then you were supposed to do all these different and find out your archetypes. And I remember finding out that my first archetype was storyteller. I was like, it is? This is like in 2000. I was right. like, really? Who knew? <laughs> and then here I am, cut to 20 years later. Yeah, that's my archetype. Yeah. So, you know, I remember one time, because I write television, you guys know, as my day job. And um, it's all about story. And we, we break story. And I think it's through that that I learned that you create story. Stories, so I remember somebody saying to me early on, a story is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then I think the famous quote goes, not necessarily in that order. Yeah. So how, do you, how do you, how for the purpose of the book and for the purpose of our lives, define a story? Can you say more about that? Hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that in the context of the book, we start with asking people to look at what the foundation is of, of the, the story, of the assumptions that they're bringing into the space that we're looking at, whether that is the space of the mind, of the body, of our relationships. So what are the beliefs? What are the, the what's the kind of you know, what is the, the, the construction? What's the foundation of the story that you are building in this space of your life? And from there, we ask questions that allow you to explore, well, now that I understand what those assumptions are, what are some of the stories that I'm telling myself? What, what do they sound like? Who, you know, whose voice do I hear when I think about them? Um, how do I uh, start to identify what beliefs and assumptions are my own? What parts, you know, what building material is my own? And what has been, you know, brought in and, and deposited into my mind and, you know, in my heart and my body by other people, people around me and my culture, um, my family. Mm -hmm. And then from there to start to ask, well, what would it sound like if I were to tell a story that were my own? If I were to continue to build this building or maybe, you know, break down the, the old construction and start anew, what would it sound like? What would it look like? What would it feel like to tell a new story? And so it's, uh, there's the space in each of the chapters to really give ourselves that opportunity to rebuild um, in this kind of like three part structure, how we think about the stories that we hold. And it's um, this, you know, kind of tide or syncopation of both seeing, taking account, as you said, seeing what is within, seeing what is ours and what came from without, and then building anew from this place of um, hopefully some sense of real deep truth and um, freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think also about, I love the idea of TV writing as, as, as a part of this conversation and, and writing fiction, you know, writing um, and writing memoir. I mean, writing in general. I mean, you start with a character often. And, and in this case, with this book, you are the character. You are the right. character. And the question is, how does this character feel about their body? How does this character mm -hmm. feel about their mind? How does this character feel about their loved ones, their partner, their spouse, their parents, their work, their tech? relationship how do they feel about death are they afraid of death right what do they feel they need to learn before they die you know Who, i think it's yeah what what is their old story right what is the story that, that when we find this character what's the story they start with and what's the story we want them to have at the end of the show where do we want to take totally. them? Away? And that's well, what, really what I what you're killing me with is the idea of stepping outside yourself like if you want to see 
what's really going on in your life. Step outside yourself, see yourself as the character in this show. What is this woman doing? Now, I love, I love how you structure it as a day. So yeah. the book is a structured as a series of concentric circles around what you, your movement through a day. And it's like, if we look at ourselves as, what is that woman doing? And how do I feel about it? Is it true? Is it her truth? I feel like if we step outside ourselves, we can get a lot more honest about what we're seeing and what we're doing. I have this thing I call the Trader Joe's clipboard test, where I basically say, if someone, like for example, I was at the store, I was gonna buy something, and I decided I thought it was too much money, okay? It's at the grocery store, so it wasn't a lot of money. Right, and I right. thought, if somebody asked me with a clipboard outside Trader Joe's, is $4 too much to pay for that thing? I'd be like, no, go ahead, spend the $4. But yet, I'm in some story in that aisle telling myself, I can't do that. Yeah. See what I'm yeah. This is the Trader Joe's Clipper test gets me out of myself and makes me see. Okay, and I feel like in a way the whole book is the Trader Joe's Clipper test. I was test. just gonna say this is this is a Trader Joe's. <laughs> yeah. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> that is fascinating. Yes. 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 That sounds great. I'm gonna. So how did you guys land on the um? I ever go to Trader the concept of the day mm -hmm. and moving through a day. Tell me more about that. About moving through the day in the book? Yes, as a way to conceptualize and structure this yes. inquiry. Yeah. Yes, because I think, you know, so the book is structured in that way to take you through your, your daily life because, you know, we find that our daily life has a pattern and our daily life has a story. And so when you wake up and you, you, you know, you, you know, and I love The Office, and we were just watching an episode of The Office, and there's a line that Aaron says, which is, suddenly I was awake. <laughs> anyway, that's for my son, if he ever watches this. Anyway, <laughs> suddenly we're awake, you know, and, our, and, we, and we can immediately engage what our mind is doing, you know? What are we thinking when we, when we awake? What is our relationship with our mind? Is it busy? Is it worried? Is it full of creativity? Is it peaceful? Is it calm? How do we want it to be? you know, and then there is the story of our bodies. Then we're conscious about coming into our bodies. How does our body feel? How do we want our body to feel? What do we think our body should feel? You know, all of these questions that we start to ask, and then we move obviously into our relationship with others, right? And how we feel we should relate to our partner, our wife, our son, or whomever, you know, mm -hmm. and then we move out into the workspace. We move out into people that we're working with. How do we want to relate to them? What is our story of interacting? Do we feel that they are competent? Do we feel, do we respect them? Do we want to work closely with them? Why is that? Do we want to work far away from them? Why is that? Does that serve us? Is that authentic to us? Um, how do we relate to technology? Do we feel better when we're looking at the screen? You know, mm -hmm. so trying to bring an awareness all the way through each moment of our day. And that's just the first four. And Lily, you can take it away. But the idea is to realize that there is a, a way in which we are constantly telling stories at every beat in every day. And we have opportunities at every moment to tell a new story, right? And we have to take advantage of those moments to stop saying, this is an old story. I want to tell a new one now. Lily, just before, this is Maggie, if you can hear me. Just, hi, okay. Tracy, you're back. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, I was gone? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm back. So, Lily, you were about to start saying something. Yes, where are yeah. you? Okay. I'm just here. I think we're all here. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, the thing that I, as Rebecca said, she, you know, stopped around technology and we move from there into being in the natural world. So we're continuing to move outward into our relationship with the environment. And that then begins to take us into our sense of who we are in community. Mm -hmm. And 
as we start to move outward and really explore what the stories are that we carry around our connectedness or our sense of separation from the earth, from you know all sentient beings, from each other, we then start to cultivate this much broader sense of like, whoa, these are some of the like super, super deeply ingrained beliefs that I have been carrying around potentially for centuries through the legacy of my family, of, you know, my ancestors, of my culture, my government, you know, whomever it may be. And these, this is how they influence the entire structure of belief systems that I carry. And that's where the, I think the concentric circles are so nice because we get to understand that it, it's all connected, that it, and the last thing that I'll say, because it takes, you know, takes you all the way through to our sense of home um, and then into what it means to, you know, reckon with our mortality. And there's a whole track in the book that you can take. There are these thematic tracks in the book. Um, I can show you, actually, um, that you can kind of see on the side of the book, there are these thumbnails with different colors. And one of them is grief, loss, and the work of healing. And so really looking at ultimately, what does it mean to, to be in a, a body, a mind carrying a story that will pass? What do we want to you know, leave behind when we leave, not knowing when we will leave? And, um, and then you know, the final moment of like, everything coming back to right where we originated with the mind with the body with all of these pieces so it, it's concentric but it's also um what's the word for that it it comes back into itself in this way that i think is really important because um it allows us to see that, that the stories we're rewriting about ourselves the stories we're telling and perhaps choosing to rewrite also inform um, the world beyond us. And I think at this moment, particularly coming back to COVID and at a time when, um, you know, sociopolitically, there's so much polarization in the stories being told and so much doubt cast upon the veracity of the stories being told that we're all questioning this. Like, what does it mean to, what? what is truth? Where is our truth collectively and individually? And so this is a tool, you know, in, in every way, in every stop along the way, um, at every clipboard to kind of check in. Well, I love that you, I wanna talk specifically about relationship because that's my favorite topic. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> There's a couple things. First of all, I will say that as a person in a relationship, um, this would be an incredible tool to just sit down with it and just open it anywhere and ask the person that you're involved with a question. Yeah. There is no way you wouldn't start to really, and in fact, um, before we started, we did, we actually made an agreement that oh yeah let's do this we're going to ask some questions <laughs> he's like not now though <laughs> not now not now right no, no. But, but like later you know um so i would say it would it has like huge bearing these questions on romantic relationships but really every kind of relationship family relationship so I thought we might talk a little bit about your relationship, the two of you, because you have been collaborators and you have had a number of different sort of iterations of your relationship over the years. And how, talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, how you're relating with regard to some of the things that are coming up in, that you're exploring in the book. Good question. Lily, you want to start? <laughs> we always say that, Rebecca. <laughs> I'm going to make you start. You're like, going to start this time. I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's easier somehow. <laughs> Tracy but, wants you to start. Tracy, you really? Hey, I'll start. All right. So, well, but the thing about this is that it's important that, that well, anyway, we'll, we'll get I see, what you're, I see where you're going. 
see where I'm going, you're with me. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we really want to, um, that's important to talk about in this conversation in terms of our relationship um, has to do with a few things. Um, the way in which we've, we've had to and been called to um, within the context of white supremacy, deal with race in, in, in the context of our relationship, for instance. Mm -hmm. I know that's something that I think a lot about. I know it's something that Lily thinks a lot about. Um, and it's something that I think is important to talk about, especially at this moment, you know, the challenges of working together, working through um, our own um, different feelings about race, <laughs> Um, our own different experiences of our of our different racial constructs that we're working within, um, and then and the stories you're bringing forward, you know, story about race. What the stories? The stories. The story. Thank about you. Race, Thank with regard to race that you're bringing so. into a relationship, you exactly. know, exactly. And and we're it's a, it's an interracial story about race, and mm -hmm. you know, I an interracial family and that family ended in divorce. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I really deeply understand the challenges um, and, and so many of us do of, of really dealing with um, that. And so one of the reasons I wanted Lily to start is because I feel very strongly that as the black person of color, it is really not my job to do the heavy lifting around talking about race and actually mm. bringing it to the fore of the story. And I have been really happy that Lily is so um, invested and committed in doing anti-racist work. And if she wasn't, I wouldn't actually be able to work with her. And mm -hmm. part of that um, story, the story of the evolution of our relationship includes that kind mm -hmm. of reshuffling of the, the work of discussing this dynamic. So that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons I said, well, let's let Lily talk because you right. know, we're all and then I tired it. No. In this conversation. <laughs> um, but there are so many others, you know, the, the conversation around our age difference, um, mm. how we've had to rewrite that story, you know, because sometimes my story is, oh my God, I'm so old, I can never do any of this. And she's got this millennial brilliance and she can do this and this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, having to really understand um, and, and rewrite that, you know, we started our relationship very much as teacher and student and mm -hmm. that's a very powerful bond of a mentor mentee dynamic. Mm -hmm. And that's a real story that has had to evolve over time. So, but I think it's very important to get back to the racial conversation and I'm going to let Lily mm -hmm. be lifting on that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm sorry, this is Maggie again. Um, we we can't see you again. Can you um, me? Yes, Tracy. Oh, Tracy. Huh. I don't know why I can see me. You can see you. Okay. Uh -huh. Just keep talking because it's really important. Yeah, I'll come back. It'll I'll, it'll just come back. I have no okay. idea why you can't see me because I can see me. Okay, but that's that's fine. As long as we can hear you, it'll it'll probably resolve itself. Okay, Lily. Sorry about that. That's okay. So there are two elements that I want to really underscore here. And one is um, the, the deep importance of um, looking at, at questions around, yes, race and white supremacy, and particularly around um, erasure and around what happens within the dynamic of a shifting story of transmuting um, our relationship from one of teacher student and mentor mentee to collaborators. And it's interesting because I think there's a way in which, um, you know, Tracy used that metaphor of the goldfish in, in the fishbowl suddenly recognizing the water all around it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really excellent uh, metaphor that I heard many years ago um, about white supremacy and how white supremacy functions in our culture, um, in the systems in which it's embedded, in that it is embedded into every system of which we are a part. And whiteness is consistently prioritized 
um, and you know blackness in this case or you know darkness of any kind is over and over again erased and we see this in culture throughout across the board it's one of um, you know I think about uh, I think that's part of the work of Rebecca, I think about your book, Black Pool, 1,000 Streams of Blackness, that mm -hmm. a part of that was reclaiming the way in which coolness has been diffused, um, mm -hmm. you know, throughout culture and really orienting it back into blackness, its source. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so for me, as a student of a black woman teacher, um, having had the privilege and the benefit of you know these many years of mentorship with Rebecca, continuing to point to the power of deeply listening to, respecting, uplifting the voices of Black women, of Black culture, of this legacy um, that we are collectively seeking to uh, you know dismantle of white supremacy is is paramount. It is at the foundation of every step along the way of how, you know, I think about um, our work together and how I think about my work uh, on my own. And then the other thing that I will add um, is that I was, I was considering how we so often, and this has been on my mind in part because of um, the beautiful book, Big Friendship by Anne Friedman and Aminatu So. Um, about how deeply we prioritize romantic relationship in our culture mm -hmm. and how um, these other really monumental, important kinds of relationship, like mentorship, mm -hmm. like studentship, truly mm -hmm. understanding how to be a student and how to learn, how to be open, mm -hmm. um, and friendship, collaboration are deprioritized and are kind of erased and it creates so much pain, like really deep pain that I myself has, have experienced as someone who has been, you know, chronically single and have like spent years sort of longing after this ideation of that romantic, you know, arrow story of prioritizing that kind of relationship in our lives. And so I want to, to reinforce also how valuable it is to use, um, the space to me to use the space of my relationship with Rebecca and our relationship to dismantle a lot of those hegemonic norms that seek to reinforce white supremacy. And um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I could keep going, but I'll. I mean, that is a really powerful and important conversation because it, what, if, when I think about a story that has affected my life in, possibly more pervasively than any other story, white supremacy would be that story, you know? Yeah. Is I also want to remind everybody that in five minutes, we're going to start taking questions. And right now we only have two. So get your questions in there because we're going to get to them. Okay. Um, the other thing, as you were speaking, I thought, you know, the most important question to ask about a story is, is it true? Like, is it true? I don't care what the story, and you're like, is that true? Because if I just start there with 90% of the thoughts that come in as facts, I will be engaged at a much deeper level with my human experience. Yes. And, you know. Yes, true. Yes, is it true? That is so absolutely profound and important. And I think, you know, when, when I think about our relationship, my relationship with Lily and, and, and race, you know, I think the truth of it is that it's very complicated and it's very challenging. Um, you know, I was thinking today about how Lily's facility with social media, for instance, has the effect of, in some ways, putting her or making her the face of our book mm. and, and what that means for a white face to mm -hmm. become so, so representative of a book that is so deeply grounded in black experience and black wisdom mm -hmm. and black language mm -hmm. and how 
you know, the, the very mechanisms by which we, we work and tell our stories now are so fraught with these kinds of discrepancies mm -hmm. and inequities. And I think that, you know, when we start to speak truthfully about these moments of challenge when race and, and, and this dynamic rears its head in our story and shapes it, um, we become much more present with what is really going on and able to talk about it and bring it to the table. I mean, it was when I was thinking about that that I, you know, texted you, texted Lily and said, we must talk about that. Mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. so and then returning to truth. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I just want to underscore what Rebecca said that um, around you know, that question of technology and social media that intersects also with the complexity around age, energy, time, mm -hmm. you know, parenthood, mm -hmm. um, these other disparities in our lives. And also highly recommend um, uh, Safiya Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression, which is about the ways that white supremacy functions within um, technology, artificial intelligence, search engines, um, the what we actually perceive on social media and the voices that are uplifted by these algorithms that are created predominantly by white men in Silicon Valley. Um, and so these are, you know, all of these issues are so um, pervasive and I think it's really important for, for me to resist them in every way that I can so that I can get back to some kind of central truth of what's actually happening, what the relationship actually is. Mm -hmm. I wanna um, ask a short question before we go to the questions. You, I, I noticed as I was reading, you used the word imagining a number of times and I feel like, you know, like in, I forget who wrote it, but Sapiens, right? And he talks about what makes a homo sapien. Well, oh, did we lose me? Yes, dear, we can hear you, but we must see you. Oh, I don't know what that is. It's probably something like a battery dying. Oh no, it's gonna come back on. Hold on. <laughs> okay, see? Okay, I have your of you but not oh, your with my camera I went and got this new camera and it's giving me trouble now That's but anyway what we do as humans is we make meanings that's what makes us separates us from the other primates and so when you talk about imagining can you just briefly before we get to the questions talk a little bit more about how the role of imagination in growth and inquiry and story Yes, if you can't see it, if you can't dream it, if you don't open your mind to infinite possibility and potential, if you can't follow what feels right into the great unknown in an attempt to find something even better than what you've had, if you can't leap, um, then your imagination has been, has been damaged. And it's up to you to repair that imagination wow. so that you can dream and so that you can become and so that you can um, have the benefit of the vast potential that is there for you. Right. So, wow. What about imagination? That's amazing. Yeah. And to that, to that end, I think the the difficulty um, that we may have imagining is often a result of the oppression of outside forces and outside stories. Mm -hmm. And so I think to free ourselves to imagine again is this is a resistance of its own, is a revolution of its own. Um, and just giving yourself the permission, Mm -hmm. to imagine a new story. Mm -hmm. Often I've had like deep, you know, tearful, just like breakdowns, just in that moment, in that flip mm -hmm. second where I go, oh my God, I have been limiting myself so profoundly mm -hmm. because I thought I couldn't imagine something else for right. myself. Yeah, yeah. 
Great. I mean, that because no matter who we are and no matter what we've done, there's always more because we have these vast, we have these vast, we are vast beings. We are vast. We are vast. Are okay. We? I'm going to go to these questions. Thanks guys for the questions. All right. Questions, but is that okay? You see questions. I see questions. Okay. I love, see questions. Questions. I love questions. Okay. Well, here's a great we have a lot of questions here. Are we do? Okay, great. So it says we carry trauma in our bodies as well as our minds. How can we use story to rewrite what we hold in our bodies? Well, in my experience, and I have held a lot of trauma in this body. I mm -hmm. used to say that the, the, the trauma of being thought of as broken, as coming from a divorced home, as being mixed race, as being you know of different class backgrounds, all screaming and crashing together. Um, I used to say that I felt that pain etched in my body. I didn't have sexual trauma. I didn't have physical abuse, but I had a kind of psychic wounding that I that I held. And, and writing for me, you know, when I did my first, when I did, wrote Black, White, Jewish, I used to light a candle before writing and just and just just take a moment of silence and just really ask, ask myself to release, talk to my body, release this, you know, release this pain. And, and you know, that could be very brief, but anyway. And then the actual writing down of the stories of what happened, of what, you know, when I looked into the fissures, when I looked into the cracks and I let those cracks start to speak, that is what I wrote on the page. And, and the more I wrote them down, it's like they, it's like a part uh, some kind of superhero show. It's like the cracks started to just heal because they live <laughs> on the page and not in my body. So that by mm -hmm. the end, process of writing it down it was like I was writing it out of me and and mm. honestly now when I do readings from that book I can't even believe that that pain existed because I I, I was able to, to 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 sort of exercise it through this mm -hmm. writing process and then mm -hmm. through the process of of letting it go and then and then making a new space to see myself so differently than I had before it kind of sealed the deal, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was able to really um, gel, and, you know, cohese, and and, yeah. and you know, be intentionally whole. So I really mm -hmm. believe in this practice for that kind of work, mm -hmm. healing trauma. Mm -hmm. Agree. Um, someone says, as a younger listener, what are your tips for making space for personal growth while also sticking true to your story without having it defined for you? Mm. So how do you make space for personal growth? I One of the things that Rebecca and I talk about a lot, and, and I really came from a background of um, deep seeking and this continual search for for answers and you know doing all of the trainings and the workshops and the uh, you know all of the things all of the ways that you could get other people to give you answers essentially um, mm -hmm. and as, as someone who you know was deeply deeply immersed in that both in growing up and then you know through the, the first years of my professional life, first decade of my professional life, um, I would say that for me, it was a question of looking at what was being motivated by my desire to belong and my willingness to manipulate my sense of truth, of core truth, in order to be accepted by the you know, the social currency or the story of the community that I had chosen to situate myself within. And so a lot of that was just, you know, asking myself ultimately, whose stories are these? Whose stories are, you know, these these truths that I'm holding on to? Um, and so, you know, how how can I start to, how can I start to find my own voice, my own story? not the answers that I have been given, not because I am relentlessly seeking an answer or because I am relentlessly seeking 
uh, belonging because I feel, as Rebecca said, you know, deeply broken in some way, or I'm carrying these traumas. Uh, how can how can I come back to myself in a way that feels true? Back to you know, as you said, Tracy. Yeah, I would add. To that, you know, as a younger listener, I'm thinking about young people a lot. I have a young son, um, and uh, not so young, but 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 an adolescent. And, and I think it's important to remember that really one of the core definitions of being an adolescent is um, wanting to fit in with others, right? And caring a lot about what other people think. And so you are writing a story out of fundamentally a sense that you want to be embedded within a social group. And in order to do that, you have to pay attention to what they believe and then carry yourself accordingly. The definition, one of the definitions of adulthood is not caring so much what other people think, right? And understanding that what you think and what you feel, uh, you know, is, is, is at least as important, if not more, than what others feel. So, so in, I think it's important to think as a younger person developmentally, right? And to understand that there are real benchmarks um, around these questions of stories and how you make your stories and how they are relational. Um, and I think that one way, you know, you said your tip, you know, what making space for personal growth, this is one of the reasons we wanted to write this book so that you can have a personal space for your own growth. You know what I mean? You can take this book anywhere. You don't have to carry your computer. You don't have to carry your phone. You can go sit under a tree. You could sit on the subway. You could, you know, you, you, by entering the book, you you are creating a commitment to to yourself and to your growth. You know what I mean? It's it, it without having to find a guru. The guru is your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So so the book mm -hmm. is really supporting that idea that you know the truth that you need to find. You just need to have right. the opportunity to find it and the support. So. Okay, here's a relationship question that I think is pretty interesting, and I might want to just jump in there for a second. Please. Because I mean, this person asks, I'm constantly falling into limerence with men that from an intellectual perspective I know would be horrible partners for me. But emotionally, I can't help myself. I just fall for them, and I feel like I have no control over it. How do I shift out of this behavior? So I the reason... Like, I just think like few stories are as powerful as our romantic stories because they they run on the same tracks as our attachment. And like without attachment, we would have all died. <laughs> so yeah. it's a deep, it's a deep groove in terms of storytelling. These are stories that you concluded in infancy about what you're bonding to. And when, when she says the word limerence, I'm understanding that limerence is a fantasy and, and that you understand it as a fantasy. A fantasy is a powerful story. So to me, the shifting of a romantic story is about understanding that it's not, it's not true. It's not a true story. You're not gonna feel better when you get the person. <laughs> you know that, but how do you make it real in your body? That's the work. You know, the shifting in behavior. But I think the important thing is that you act your way into the right mind as opposed to, and then getting a new story allows me to take the right action. Because I think, what about the fact that stories are addictive in a way? Like they pay off in our brains. And so that's why we're reluctant to give them up because it feels good every time I think, oh my God, and at the end we're going to kiss and it's going to be great. You know, so how, yeah. you know what I mean? that's why we cling to certain stories because totally, you know, we've talked a lot about stories that don't work for you, but what about the stories that do, even though in the big picture they don't? Well, and I think something that we get from, um, you know, whatever story we're, con you're back, I can see you again. Oh, <laughs> what, great. Whatever the payoff I is. You, which is lovely. I think it's really important to to 
the point that you made, Tracy, that we're getting something from the stories that we are telling, that we keep repeating, figure out what that is. What is it that that mm -hmm. limerence is giving you? For me, I was repeating a story over and over and over again with men because it every time I did it, I reinforced, I proved to myself the quote unquote truth of the story mm -hmm. I made up about myself when I was five years old with some kid on mm -hmm. the playground. And mm -hmm. I needed to be able to identify that story and understand that I was doing this behavior. Mm -hmm. I was choosing this story again and again because it was comfortable, because it was my habituated pattern, because it was what I believed about myself. And we all know we have infinite capacity to accept things that feel really untrue ultimately and really not safe within our bodies. And so figure out what that is, figure out what the payoff is and figure out the behaviors that you're associating with that payoff and then undo it. <laughs> And then it'll, okay, it'll, it'll, it'll listen. Yes. Right. I want to understand something. So, so this question out there, whoever it is, my dear being. So, so the question is, I'm, I, I'm emotionally attached to uh, someone else, but it causes me great pain. What do no, I do? I know. Question. It's I know. It's not going to work out on an intellectual level, but emotionally, oh. I can't stop going for it. Oh, 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 oh. And so the question is how to stop doing that. Yeah, how do I shift? Oh, 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 oh. I know we have three minutes, okay? Yeah, but you know, that's a I think the answer to that is, you know, trust yourself and, and trust your mind and trust what, what you know and then and then act on that. I mean, it, you know, this this idea of changing a story is not an easy undertaking. Mm -hmm. This takes a tremendous amount of will. You know, when we yeah. talk about Changing your mind. When you talk about changing your mind, as a human being, changing your mind is one of the most difficult things you can do. So don't beat yourself up. This is this is the human experience. This yeah. is the deal. So yeah. I think it's important to to if you know for sure that it's not going to work. I mean, and you've gone through it, and you know, you need to just really believe that mm -hmm. and make some different decisions because otherwise, right. you're going to waste time. And they're yeah. not understanding time. We don't yeah. have as much time as we think we have. So true. The longer you spend doing this thing that you know mm -hmm. is not going to help you, the more time you're wasting or the more time mm -hmm. you're spending and, and not finding the thing that will work. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And this goes back to the book in terms mm -hmm. of how do you want to die? Do you want to die a good death? And what will that look like? A good death does not include having ignored your instincts and done behavior that you knew was not going to be helpful for you over <laughs> and over again. When you're dying, you're not going to think to yourself, holy shit, that was a great choice. Do you know what I mean? Oh what my God. If you feel good when you're dying is if you feel like, you know what? I stopped that behavior. Yeah. I got control of my mind and I did something different. Yeah. And I was able to benefit from that and I lived many years or many minutes Mm -hmm. that particular habitual. Yeah. So, oh my god, I love that. And, and I also and I also liberated everyone around me from yes. the delusion of that story. Yeah, yeah. That's so funny you say that, Rebecca, because the thing that makes me really do the hard work of changing in relationships, mm -hmm. I always joke that it's that I know that if I keep going the way I'm going, I'm going to be lying on my deathbed holding the hand of my new boyfriend. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, everybody, here he is. Yeah. I mean, really, we that's a good deal. to end this. <laughs> we could die tomorrow. You can die tonight. There's not as much. No, 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 no. We have, <laughs> we have to. I want to have a new experience. I want to have a new experience. Yes. Yeah. Um, this, you guys, thank you so much. This has been really um, moving. No. And Maggie's back. Hi. Hi, Maggie. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Tracy, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, I, I, I took notes. I took notes.
We would not have wanted to do our first uh, night with anyone else. I really so no. appreciate you. And thank you, and thank you, Lily. And um, I can't wait to see all of you. Everyone. Uh, okay. and they, for those whose questions we didn't get to, we would love to answer your questions. As Rebecca said, we love questions. Um, so you can mm -hmm. you know, send them to us on Instagram, find us. We want to hear yeah. from you. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you again to our guests and to all of you who tuned in this evening. We greatly appreciate everyone's time and your support of independent bookstores. Purchase a copy of What's Your Story, which will include a signed book plate by clicking on the green button below your screen. We're also accepting donations on our website. If you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, make sure to follow us on Crowdcast and subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you to everyone who presented tonight and have a great evening and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.